Communications. I'm a plumber and I'm on site for uh, uh, a job, and we got uh, we're we're snaking a drain, and we were uh, we've been pulling back. Uh, we probably pulled back about 10 pounds, 15 pounds of like it looks like flesh type of stuff, meat, and I don't we don't know what it is. This 911 call transports us back to December 29th, 2017 at a residence on McMillan Drive in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. The caller, Sean Farndon, a plumber by profession, was met with a disturbing discovery of human flesh clogging the drains. The subsequent investigation led the police to the downstairs neighbor, a 45-year-old man named Adam Strong. To everyone's astonishment, Strong promptly confessed to having human remains in his freezer. However, this was neither the beginning nor the end of this strange and twisted tale. This macabre account has a deeper and more complex backstory that demanded further exploration. To whom did the remains belong? And how did they come to be in the bathroom's drains? Hi, and welcome back to Mysterious 7, friends. Today we're looking at a truly disturbing case from Oshawa, Canada, where human flesh was found in a bathroom drain. But first, if you still haven't subscribed to our channel, kindly consider hitting the subscribing button and the bell icon below to stay updated with our latest content. So without any further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Located in the province of Ontario, Canada, Oshawa holds the distinction of being the sixth largest city in the province. Positioned approximately 60 kilometers east of Toronto, it enjoys a picturesque setting along the shoreline of Lake Ontario, and its population exceeds 170,000. While Oshawa was once renowned as the sole automotive capital of Canada, it's since transformed into an education and health sciences hub, though General Motors continues to play a significant role in the city's economy. The city also offers a plethora of educational and employment opportunities. Due to its relatively low crime rate, it's esteemed as a safe and family-friendly area, making it an appealing choice for commuters. Despite this enchanting backdrop, in 2017, Oshawa experienced a harrowing crime that shook the nation to its core. On September 11th, 2017, a disturbing discovery was made in Lake Ontario near the Oshawa Harbour. An 11-year-old boy fishing with his grandfather noticed a floating torso in the water. Authorities immediately responded to the scene, recovering the torso and initiating a thorough investigation. In the 11th of September, 2017, we received a call from some fishermen that were down on the uh, pier. They saw something in the water and they thought it was, at first it was a turkey carcass and they began to cast their spoons. But once it landed on the cement pier, it became pretty apparent that it was uh, the torso of a, of a female. Despite extensive searches conducted by marine units, no other body parts were found. A post-mortem examination was carried out, revealing that the torso belonged to a female, but the cause of death remained inconclusive. Nevertheless, evident signs of trauma led the coroner to determine it was a homicide. The absence of a head posed a significant challenge in identifying the body, so DNA testing was the only viable option. It wasn't until November 9, 2017, two months after the disturbing discovery, that the heartbreaking truth was revealed. The torso belonged to Rory Hash, an 18-year-old pregnant Oshawa woman who'd gone missing in late August of the same year. Born on July 9, 1999, Rory Chantel Hash was the apple of the eye of her mother, Shannon Dion. While not much is known about her father, some of her relatives had a reputation for leading a daring lifestyle. Her grandfather, Bernard Gwyndon, a former outlaw biker, gangster, and boxer, gained notoriety as the founder and national president of the Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club. Rory's uncle, Harley Gwyndon, was also an active member of the Hells Angels, another outlaw motorcycle club. Despite these familial associations, Rory's childhood was relatively uneventful and she was described as a kind and bright young girl. In addition to her mother, Rory shared a deep bond with her godmother and Shannon's closest friend, Chrissia Mildik. Just like Shannon, Chrissia too had only good things to say about Rory. During her early years, Rory excelled in school, even earning the prestigious title of Army Cadet of the Year in her local squad at the age of 13. However, Rory's life changed for the worse during the first year of high school when someone introduced crystal meth to her, which triggered addiction struggles. In the subsequent years, Rory's life became tumultuous, with drugs becoming a significant part of her existence. 
Desperate to cope with her addiction, she turned to prostitution, causing great distress to her mother, Shannon. Shannon, in turn, sought external assistance from the Children's Aid Society to help her daughter overcome these challenges. Thankfully, her efforts paid off in the beginning of 2017 when Rory finally began to make strides towards improving her life. She secured a job, returned to school, and found stability by moving in with her boyfriend, Tony. Despite her past struggles, Rory was determined to turn her life around and find a better path for herself. In August 2017, Rory told her mother that she was pregnant. She really wanted to keep the baby, so Shannon supported her. But what Shannon didn't know was that Rory had relapsed into drug use. On August 28, 2019, near the Midtown Mall in Oshawa, Rory had an encounter with Constable Christopher Kane. Over the years, Constable Kane had conducted wellness checks on Rory and made earnest efforts to connect her with social services to aid in her struggles. During their conversation, Rory revealed that she'd been using drugs again, including cocaine and crystal meth, and had gone on dates to pay for these drugs. Deeply concerned for Rory's well-being, Constable Kane resolved to find suitable social services to assist her. Unfortunately, the teenager had vanished by the time he returned. On August 29, 2017, the day after her encounter with Constable Christopher Kane, Rory was brought into an Oshawa hospital by a friend and her mother after suffering a mental relapse. Unfortunately, they were unable to remain with her for an undisclosed reason, and after only a few minutes, they departed, leaving Rory alone at the hospital. Strangely, just 15 minutes later, Rory made a decision to leave the hospital premises before receiving the necessary medical assistance. She was described as having some sort of a mental episode. The mother made a decision to take her up to the hospital to have her checked. The mother and daughter that brought her there left, leaving Rory in the care of the hospital. For whatever reason, she ended up leaving before she was actually seen by a physician. We see her exiting uh, the hospital on her own. That was the last known sighting we had of her. Surveillance footage captured her calmly walking out of the hospital, marking the last confirmed sighting of her. From that point on, her whereabouts were unknown. When Rory's family and friends didn't hear from her for a few days, their concerns grew. I went over to her apartment. Nothing had changed. She hadn't been there. Nobody had heard from her. I realized something's wrong. Terribly, terribly wrong. And I just, I, I had a really bad feeling. Fearing the worst, they filed a missing persons report with the Durham police, sparking a citywide search. They also distributed missing flyers throughout the area with her photograph on display. I made thousands of missing persons posters. There wasn't a place that you could go downtown Oshawa that you didn't see my goddaughter's face. I made sure that every post had her picture. Sadly, every effort to locate Rory Hash remained futile until DNA evidence finally linked the recovered torso to her, confirming the devastating truth that she had become the victim of a violent crime. You don't know how your sweet goddaughter ended up dismembered and the rest of her is missing and thrown in a lake like she's a piece of garbage in our little town. But the case was far from over. The police still faced the daunting task of locating the remaining parts of her body and piecing together the puzzles surrounding her tragic demise. A breakthrough was on the horizon, but remarkably, it came about in a manner that defied all expectations. Just two months after the torso was found, a couple living in the upstairs apartment at 19 McMillan Drive had persistent plumbing issues plaguing their home. The situation escalated to the point where the couple had no choice but to call in plumbers on December 29th, 2017. He didn't want any plumbers called. Um, he tried snaking the drain himself. Uh, he was taking efforts to, to fix it. Since no blockage was found in the upstairs toilet, the plumbers requested entry to the apartment of the downstairs neighbor, 45-year-old Adam Strong. As they began their work in the basement toilet, a foul smell filled the air. This was unlike anything they'd encountered in their regular line of work. It was utterly appalling. The situation became even more unsettling when Adam's behavior took a nervous turn. He paced the floor, closely scrutinizing their every move and asking them numerous questions. Although the plumbers were annoyed by his behavior, they chose to brush it off. Adam justified it by saying that he was simply curious as he'd attempted to fix the problem before, but failed. They probably would have ignored him altogether, 
But what they found inside the pipe changed everything. To their horror, they extracted a disturbing 18-inch long pink flesh-like stringy substance with hair attached to it. Alarmed by the shocking find, they wasted no time and immediately contacted the police to report what they'd encountered. Communications. I'm a plumber and I'm on site for uh, a job. And we got, uh, we're, we're snaking a drain and we were, uh, we've been pulling back, uh, we probably pulled back about 10 pounds, 15 pounds of like, it looks like flesh type of stuff, meat, and I don't, we don't know what it is. Within minutes, the officers from the Durham Regional Police arrived at the rental property. They determined that the fleshy substance was indeed human flesh. After gathering crucial information from the plumbers and the concerned couple, the officers proceeded to speak to Adam Strong. As they spoke to him, they braced themselves for the unexpected. However, nothing could have prepared them for what Adam had to say. They recall him putting his head down and making a comment almost instantaneously that uh, the jig's up, uh, it's a body. If you want the rest of her, she's in my freezer and she's pretty defleshed. Adam was immediately taken into custody while police began to search his apartment. It was nothing short of a house of horrors. Every inch was filled with filth and an overwhelming smell of decay infused the air. In the bathroom, they found that Adam had removed the toilet while trying to address the blockage issue. However, it was in the bedroom where the most gruesome discovery awaited them. Inside a freezer, they came across the remains of a young woman, her head concealed within a plastic bag. The body was in a state of decomposition, just as Adam had described. On the neck of the remains was a tattoo with the phrase, I live, the exact same one that Rory Hash had. Rory had a distinct tattoo. She had the word alive tattooed on her neck. And when they looked f through the freezer, they found a uh, human head. And there was a tattoo uh, clearly displayed. I knew right then, yeah, it's, it's Rory. Further DNA testing confirmed beyond any shadow of a doubt that the remains found in Adam Strong's apartment were that of Rory. There was no shortage of evidence of Rory's presence in the apartment. Her blood was on Adam's bedroom wall and ceiling and bodily fluids belonging to him were found on her remains. Her running shoes were found wrapped in plastic and stained in blood. The police discovered that Adam had arranged a proper table with equipment as a makeshift autopsy station. Shivers went down their spines as they realized that was the place where Adam had dismembered his victim. During their search, police also found multiple explicit toys, restraining devices, knives, and an explosive device, which turned out to be a pipe bomb. Thankfully, it was disarmed before it could cause any danger. No one could figure out why it might be in Adam's possession. Tonight, a loud bang in the heart of an Oshawa neighborhood, the controlled explosion of a suspicious package at the scene of a suspicious death investigation for Durham Regional Police. Unfortunately, due to a lack of direct evidence that Adam had murdered Rory, police were unable to charge him with murder. Instead, they charged him with indignity to a body. No, at that point, what the cause of death was. To lay that charge, you, you need the grounds. The decision was made to continue our investigation to see where it took us down the road. It was time for the investigation to have a closer look at this 45-year-old man's life. Not much was known about Adam Strong, but he moved into the Macmillan rental apartment in early 2007. Over the years, Adam had worked as a film set security guard in Oshawa and a gas station employee at two different locations in Ajax. Those acquainted with Adam Strong labeled him as a weirdo with a cocky attitude who thought of himself as smarter than he was. He had a tendency for talking nonstop, never knowing how to shut up. One of his ex-girlfriends, whose name has been kept private, described him as abusive and controlling. Much like others, Adam's landlord, Eugenie Papadakis, also had unsettling experiences with him. In fact, in March 2017, following a house fire, she and her granddaughter went to inspect Strong's unit at the Macmillan Drive home. They found the unit cluttered with what appeared to be garbage, old food, and other random items. Needless to say, the sight sickened them to the core. I've never seen Adam take any garbage out. Everything is here. Oh. Knives by the bed. Oh my God. Detectives also learned that Adam showed a keen interest in BDSM practices. He went as far as posting a picture of handcuffs in his room, 
captioning it with the chilling phrase, Home is where my handcuffs hang. Additionally, Adam was deeply engrossed in reviewing adult videos and books, which clearly indicated his fixation on explicit content. These revelations provided valuable insight into his psyche, shedding light on the dark and disturbing world that existed within his apartment. However, it wasn't enough to bring him down for murder, so detectives set their eyes on a confession. During the early morning hours of December 30th, 2017, Durham homicide detectives Darren Short and Hermano Durego sat down with Adam Strong for an interrogation. By this time, Adam had already contacted his lawyer. Detectives knew this was their only chance. His bail hearing was scheduled the next day, and after that, they wouldn't be able to interview him without a court order. The pressure was on to obtain crucial information from Strong before the opportunity slipped away. You said to the officers, if you're looking for the rest of her, you'll find her in the freezer. My question to you is the person in that freezer, Rory. I decline to answer that question. Okay. You're saying you decline to answer it, but you're shaking your head this way. Does that mean anything? No. Okay. Any interest from you at all in telling us your side of things? No. Nothing? When the detectives started the interrogation, they didn't know what to expect. At the very least, they expected that Adam would be nervous now that he was finally caught. However, he was calm, composed, and most of all, indifferent to the situation. However, the biggest challenge was extracting information related to Rory Hash. His stubbornness was perplexing, especially considering Adam's earlier confession about having human remains in his freezer. I was told these things go on for like hours, is that true? The detectives, well aware that time was running out, resorted to a different approach. They aimed at tapping into Adam's emotions, hoping to reach a part of him that might feel remorse or empathy for the victim and her loved ones. We've been dealing with that family since September. Um, very traumatic, very emotional, um, having a tough time dealing with it. Um, we're trying to bring closure to that family as best we can, but been a struggle up till now. In an attempt to deflect the probing questions directed at him, Adam kept changing the subject, but his answers were nothing short of chilling. Can I? Can, uh, I guess it's, can, no, not, not Kleenex. Can I be on the table there? Sure, can. Not be on the table, just. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. No, no problem. When he started feeling the pressure, he would do certain things to relieve the pressure. He changed the subject quickly. Right now, did you feel like you're none? None. No weight off your shoulders. You was just. Can I get a refill, even from a tap on this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, awesome. He'll talk about any subject under the sun, except for the reason why he's sitting across from us. That's just what, the way Adam's wired. Um, I have uh, movies from the library. That needs to be. While they'd gathered enough evidence to establish that Rory Hash had been in his apartment, their ultimate objective was to uncover the truth about what had transpired and what had led to her tragic fate. Unfortunately, Adam Strong proved to be more than they bargained for. He remained resolutely tight-lipped in response to every question related to Rory. How did you know Rory? Did you kill Rory? Sorry, I'm not saying anything. Is there other people we should be worried about? Hmm? Is there other girls out there that we should be worried about that are missing? Just the one. But would he be able to look directly at the picture of the poor girl and still show indifference? I want you to look at that. I did look at it. Yeah. And it's going to stay there. Okay. 
All right. No, I'm not going to look at it anymore. No, you don't have to. I'm not going to. The reason I, I, we're, we're showing these photographs, we're employing on his decency as a human being. It had little effect on him at all. When playing on his conscience proved to be ineffective as a ploy, the detectives resorted to appealing to his greed as a last hope to gain his trust. Oh, you can eat with me? Not let you alone, man. Appreciate that, man. You're trying to build that relationship with him. I'm you know, treating you with respect. I'm making sure your needs are met. There's a social interaction that's been put in place now where it's just two people, I've got you a meal. Okay. You ever owned any guns or anything like that? No. No, not in the guns. I'm, I'm, no, I am. Yeah, are you? And I'm very proficient. Yeah. You collect knives? I wouldn't say collect, yeah. but I do enjoy a knife. How many knives do you have? Like, those type of knives, like collector type? Um, I have that one and I have a sword. As Adam appeared to be answering the questions, Detective Durego attempted to steer the conversation back to the murder investigation. Frustratingly, he reverted to his usual reluctant self. Um, the X used to love it in there. Rory's DNA, would it be on that? No. No. Okay, neither. I appreciate it. Feel free to check. As the interrogation continued over the next two hours, it became increasingly evident that they were going nowhere. Adam's refusal to divulge any relevant information left them with more questions than answers. With no breakthrough in sight, they reluctantly made the decision to end the interrogation. Let's just shut it down now. We could have sat there for another three or six hours. I don't think we were going to get any different results. Yeah, um, well, you know what? We'll, uh, we'll walk back. How Rory Hash crossed paths with Adam Strong remained shrouded in mystery. Fortunately for the detectives, Adam was not granted bail further solidifying his stay in custody. Meanwhile, the Durham police kept the search at Adam's residence alive in their quest for evidence and clues. They also seized his boat and appealed to the public to come forward with information regarding Adam's boating trips on Lake Ontario. Rory's post-mortem report also provided a better insight. She had multiple injuries on her body, including skull fractures. The medical examiner couldn't determine exactly if these wounds were caused before or after her death. Forensic tests also suggested the presence of drugs in her system at the time of her death. Her body also bore signs that she was wearing some sort of restraining device. Inside the home, detectives found a bent hammer with Rory's DNA on it. The detectives believed it was the likely murder weapon. However, it wasn't the most significant find. Just when detectives thought they'd seen it all, another startling discovery was made. In July of 2017, seven months after Adam Strong's apprehension, Inside a kitchen drawer of his home, a specialty hunting knife was discovered. That knife's only designed for one use and one use only. It's a knife used for, by hunters for gutting and skinning animals. This knife was covered in human tissue. Shockingly, forensic analysis revealed that the DNA found on the knife did not match Rory. Instead, it belonged to another female named Candace Fitzpatrick. Disturbing developments in the murder investigation of Rory Hache, whose partial remains were found inside the central Oshawa home late last year. Police today confirming that they have found the DNA belonging to a second young woman who went missing nearly a decade ago. Born on February 3, 1989, little is known about Candace Fitzpatrick's early life. Candace's father, William Fitzpatrick, ended up divorcing her mother, whose name has not been made public. After the separation, William moved to Alberta, while Candace remained with her mother in Oshawa. Candace's life took a tumultuous turn, marked by an erratic lifestyle. She disappeared from home at one point, prompting her father to search for her in Oshawa. Upon her return, Candace expressed a desire to live alone. By the time Candace turned 19 in 2008, her life had spiraled into chaos. Just like Rory Hash, she was a troubled young woman struggling with drugs and resorting to selling herself to fund her addiction. Candace frequently vanished from home for days or even weeks at a time, but she always returned, until March of 2008, when her family last saw her. Growing increasingly concerned about her absence, Candace's father, William, embarked on an extensive search for his daughter across the province. He also created a Facebook missing persons group, garnering nearly 1,200 members. Surprisingly, Candace was not officially reported missing to the police until 2010, two years after she disappeared. William revealed that he'd spoken to the police multiple times in 2008 regarding Candace, but due to her habits and lifestyle, 
they'd not taken her disappearance seriously. After a decade of agonizing uncertainty and waiting, Candace Fitzpatrick's family finally received the devastating news they'd always feared. The undeniable resemblance between these two women went beyond just their troubled lives. Their physical appearances bore a striking similarity as well. And both victims were uh, more of a petite build, longer, you know, brown hair. Almost a splitting image of each other. Ironically, despite their disappearances occurring a decade apart, they both met the same tragic fate at the hands of the same person. It's heartbreaking to think that if Adam had not gone undetected for a decade after Candace's demise, Rory might still be alive today. Candace's remains were not located yet, and there was only one person who held the key to solving this haunting mystery. Investigators were able to get the prosecutors to drop the initial charges off of Adam Strong. Instead, this time he was charged with first-degree murder for both Rory Hash and Candace Fitzpatrick. This gave the detectives an opportunity to interrogate Adam one more time. Dropping and then the, the newer charges was, I, I think, a, a calculated risk on their part because the indignity of the body was essentially a slam dunk. There's no evidence to suggest or to prove that he premeditated killing the victim. There's no suggestion that it wasn't just for example, an accident, that does put a lot of pressure on that interview because this is essentially the one opportunity you're going to have to sit down with, with Strong and gather what you can gather. And if you don't, there's a very real risk that he is set free, essentially. Realizing that the stakes were high, the Durham Police Department brought in Detective Paul Mitten, a highly skilled and experienced interrogator, known for his expertise in handling complex and challenging cases. My preparation for the interview with Adam Strong actually uh, began by watching his first interview. It was apparent to me that Adam Strong uh, shied away from any direct questions. Uh, I'm not saying anything, I'm sorry. So I knew that wasn't going to be my approach. How you doing? Good, you? Meh, had better days. Oh, I'm sure. Paul Mitten. Adam Strong. Adam, hey, call me Paul today. Adam. All right, Paul. On November 18th, 2018, 11 months after the first one, Adam Strong sat for another interrogation, and it was the most crucial one. To Detective Mitten's surprise, Adam voluntarily came forward with information regarding his treatment in jail. I have been amazed at how well I have been treated. Other than a few staff members at the 8th SAG. And that's going to continue today. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you that. I mean, that's, it's good. That's wonderful. Well, you know Detective Mitten saw it as a positive sign that Adam was at least willing to engage in conversation, even if he hadn't yet broached the subject of the case. Drawing from his knowledge of Adam's temperament gathered from the previous interview, he understood the importance of building a rapport and gaining his trust before delving into the sensitive details of the interrogation. So Detective Mitten was quick to oblige when Adam asked for food. With a bridge of understanding between them now solidly in place, Detective Mitten sensed that it was the right time to start talking about the case. Um, how old was Rory? 18. Okay, how much of her body did you guys get back? Obviously the entire skeletal structure, right? Well, we obviously whatever was in the house. Yes, we, in the uh, freezer. Yes. And how much of it were you able to pull out of the pipes? Uh, quite a bit. It was, it was bad luck. Yeah, that's what I tell people. They're like, you're stupid. I'm like, Are you kidding me? Well, that's an awesome way. Yeah. I just, I just got greedy. That's all. The chilling lack of remorse in Adam's demeanor as he discussed his actions would have left any other human being shocked and appalled. However, Detective Mitten knew better than to react to his words. Instead, he continued the interrogation. You were saying? Um, so the team gets put together, and like I said, last seen Rory August 30th. Kenny, uh, the torso pops up. Unknown female. September 11th. Teams yeah, she together. said she, she, she knew in her bones that it was her, her daughter. I read that in an article. About in a bizarre twist, Adam Strong remained adamant in his denial that Rory was pregnant. He even admitted to holding her reproductive organs in his hands, further claiming that she was not carrying a child during her death. The fact that he was far more concerned about proving himself right than taking responsibility for his own actions further revealed a troubling aspect of his character. He was a man with absolutely no concern for human lives whatsoever. She also swears like a mother's 
been in the news many times. Mm -hmm. It's not just my daughter, it's my unborn grandchild that was murdered too. Uh, and she's adamant. Uh, she was not pregnant. Uh, her mom is, you know, I think, okay. part, I think part of the hate I on can't, I can't even, I can't, I don't want to go into how I know, but I know. But, I mean, according to her mom, she was pregnant. I, I couldn't be any more sure than someone who did a, an, a, 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 an autopsy. Okay. She was not pregnant. I can, I would bet my life. That's not that that matters. Anyway. Would you know what to look for? I wouldn't know what to look for. I didn't see a baby. Okay. Done. Okay. Okay. Like, there's no way of getting around that I, that I chopped her up. There's no way. Okay. And I understand that. But... I had to cut all that stuff up. I held our entire okay. reproductive system in my hand. Thank you for telling me that. Okay. Seriously. In the process of proving his words, Adam had inadvertently blurted out a few things he didn't intend to say. This became a monumental moment in the history of the case, as it was the first time he had actually disclosed something that could implicate him in the murders. Unbelievably, throughout the rest of the interview, Adam left breadcrumbs of information, much to Mitten's delight as he witnessed it. I said I would have dumped her in 600 feet of water and she would have never come up. Okay. Every time there was a little bit of information given to me, maybe even unknowingly by Adam Strong, inside I was giving myself a little fist pump, only because I thought we were advancing the case a little bit here. Eight hours into the interrogation, Detective Paul Mitten decided to change tactics slightly. He confronted Adam Strong with a compelling presentation of the evidence stacked against him. Like, were you waiting for that to happen, the door knock? I was, I was like, am I going to get away with this? I'm like, probably not. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would assume from the point the plumbing started to act up. It was, it was like, oh, were you sleeping at night or were you like, is it nonstop on your mind? Oh, uh, I slept. So there was some photos of Rory's bruises and I presented the photographs and asked Adam about them. Obviously, searched the apartment. Mm hmm and found some things in there that lead us to believe that we have what caused that injury. Yeah? Well, in the apartment? In the apartment. Wow. So, did that surprise you? Yes. At this point, the surprising aspect of this interrogation was not just Adam's intrigue about the presented evidence, but the degree of his excitement that seemed almost unbelievable. Mitten kept him engaged in the conversation. So, the 24th, when you start this, you said Christmas Eve? Yes. Are you, are you doing this while it's frozen or is it partially defrosted? Completely defrosted. Okay. Now that would take several hours, wouldn't it? Uh, no, not a bathtub full of hot water. Oh, okay. Okay. It, like, within a couple hours? I, I wouldn't wager. I had to fill the bathtub up a few times. So that's to keep the water hot? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. I don't know if I should really be talking about that, but ultimately you have me on the... Yeah. There's no getting around that. Yep. Yep. And so, like, this was all one piece, and then this was all one piece? Up I couldn't... Yeah, really? sorry, man, I don't remember. Really? Yeah, it wasn't It wasn't important to me, man. Okay. I know that might sound cold and callous, but it just... Oh, I just... I, I, I just assume it would be like the 9-11... No, I, not I, at all. I, I, uh, I, you just remember this because it's so, like, monumental. I did not feel that way at all. Adam was confident that the conversation between them was strictly limited to the dismemberment of the bodies. Little did he know that his indirect admissions and subtle revelations were providing the detectives with crucial inferences about the entire sequence of events surrounding the heinous crimes. After ten hours, the interrogation came to an end, when Paul Mitten felt that he had all the information he needed. How come you got brought in? Are you just like a lead? No, I, I, you know what, I talked to people for a little bit. Okay, that's like it. Just, yeah, I right. did a lot of interviews, that's all. It's like, if you never knew, like, you'd go and have a beer with me, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to blast. Man, go get some sleep, dude. Listen, I appreciate you sticking it out. Well, you sure. don't really have a choice. No, but... Uh, but I probably said more than I should have. Probably. Yeah. Probably. But that's okay. Maybe I got nowhere to go, other than back to the cell, with yeah. a concrete slab, horrible. Yeah. There was no clear confession where he said, 
this is how I killed so-and-so and this is how I killed so-and-so, but it was a series of inculpatory statements. And I think at the end of the day, I'm sure he wishes he hadn't said as much as he did. On September 28th, 2020, 12 years after Candace went missing and three years after Rory went missing, Adam Strong went on trial for both of these murders. Despite the evidence piled up against him, he pleaded not guilty to both charges. During the trial, the prosecution meticulously presented a wealth of evidence, including the chilling interrogation footage, to support their case against Adam Strong. The testimonies of five women who had been assaulted by him further added to the weight of the prosecution's claims. Though Adam did not disclose the details of Rory's death during the interrogation, the prosecution constructed their theories based on the available evidence. According to their account, Adam enticed Rory to his home with a promise of money for physical relations. Once inside, he restrained her in a disturbing BDSM-style contraption and savagely beat her with a hammer found in his home. Sadly, no one was living upstairs at that time, so no one could have heard her screams. Following her tragic death, he dismembered her lifeless body and disposed of the torso in the Oshawa Harbor. Cell phone data placed Adam in the area on September 4, 2017, a week before Rory's torso was found, adding to the mounting evidence against him. Similarly, the prosecution believed that Candace had suffered the same fate at Adam's hands, but at that point, they had not yet located her remains. The defense, however, denied Adam's involvement in Rory's murder, claiming that her death resulted from an overdose and Adam had simply tried to dispose of the body. As for Candace, the defense contended that there was insufficient evidence to prove she died in Adam's home. They also pointed out the limited size of the freezer, suggesting that it could not have accommodated the remains of two victims. Nonetheless, after carefully reviewing all the evidence, Judge Mr. Joseph DeLuca was firmly convinced of Adam Strong's involvement in the murders. He saw through the defense's theories and concluded that the evidence presented by the prosecution was compelling and incriminating. In the court, Adam tried to blame his actions on his troubled childhood. He claimed that he'd suffered a traumatic assault at the tender age of four, an event that had left an indelible mark on his psyche. He was also said to have struggled to cope with the overwhelming emotions and trauma from his past, leading him to succumb to devilish thoughts. He even offered condolences to the victim's families, yet he didn't seem to mean a word. He exhibited an alarming level of indifference and lack of remorse for the lives he'd taken. The evidence presented during Adam Strong's trial made it clear that he was fully aware of the gravity of his actions and the consequences they carried. It was apparent that the man knew exactly what he was doing and had no qualms about it. In fact, he saw prison as a viable solution to his dire circumstances. Due to loneliness and financial distress, he was willing to trade his freedom for the basic necessities that prison could offer. According to Canadian law, an individual may be charged with first-degree murder under certain circumstances. These circumstances include premeditated murder, where the act was planned and deliberate, and cases involving police officers or prison workers, reflecting the severity of the offense. First-degree murder charges can also apply if the act occurs during the commission of other serious crimes, such as assault, kidnapping, terrorism, theft, and similar offenses. However, in certain situations, a murder charge may be reduced to manslaughter if it can be demonstrated that the individual acted in the heat of passion caused by sudden provocation. It was determined that Rory Hash died during an assault, so Adam Strong was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was convicted of manslaughter regarding the death of Candace Fitzpatrick. Judge found that Strong murdered Rory Hache while committing a sexual act and died of blunt force trauma to the head. But because Candace's body was never recovered, while it was possible she met the same fate, he was not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that she was murdered and found him guilty of the lesser charge. In May 2021, Adam Strong was handed a life sentence for his first-degree murder conviction in the killing of Rory Hash. Additionally, he received an 18-year prison term to be served concurrently for killing Candace Fitzpatrick. This was the highest possible sentence permissible within the country's legal framework. Moments before Adam Strong was taken into prison in handcuffs, the judge directly addressed him with these powerful words. Your moment before us is done. From here, you'll go to prison. You will never be seen in public again. In time, you will be forgotten. You will neither be famous nor infamous. You will simply be gone. The sentencing marked the end of a long and painful journey for the families of both victims, and they were seen celebrating outside the courtroom after the sentencing hearing. Ah! Yeah! 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 
He addressed Adam. He let Adam know on un un certain terms. What he what he did was wrong, and he's being punished for it. I think the judge did an incredible job of bringing this man to his knees. Yeah. I feel amazing. Hey, we let them rest. Today, this monster's off our street, and he's no longer a part of our day. Though nothing could bring back their loved ones, the families felt that justice was served. In July 2021, Strong provided crucial information regarding the whereabouts of Candace Fitzpatrick's remains. Acting on this tip-off, on November 4th, 2021, he accompanied the police to a general area near Secreto Drive and Britannia Avenue East in Oshawa, where he claimed to have buried the body. Subsequently, on November 8th, the authorities were able to locate the remains. Following the forensic examination, the remains were positively identified as those of Candace Fitzpatrick on November 13th, 2021. The conclusive identification was announced through a press conference on February 16th, 2022. Candace's father, William, was still in disbelief. Did you ever think you'd see this day? No. Never thought I'd see her remains, ever. The reason behind Adam Strong's sudden change of heart remains a mystery, but speculation suggests that he may have been seeking fame and recognition for his actions. Despite the tragic circumstances that brought them together, the Hash and Fitzpatrick families have remained supportive of one another and are finding strength and healing as they navigate through the difficult aftermath of these horrific events. The cases of Rory Hash and Candace Fitzpatrick are solved, but police suspect that Adam Strong might have been involved in the deaths of other women. In June 2022, the police found some clothing evidence in Adam's apartment. However, they've not divulged specific details about this evidence, keeping it confidential as they continue their investigation. This story is undeniably tragic and profoundly disturbing. The most unsettling aspect is that Adam Strong managed to remain completely off the police's radar throughout his heinous acts. He operated unnoticed, hidden in plain sight. Neighbors lived around him, extended greetings, offering help, and inviting him to social gatherings, completely oblivious to the sinister truth that lurked within him. The chance that this case was ultimately solved due to a twist of fate is absolutely terrifying. One can't help but wonder if there were any red flags that could have been recognized earlier. Were there any missed opportunities to prevent his atrocities? What do you think could have been done to keep this man off the streets? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. If you have any cases you'd like us to cover, we eagerly await your suggestions in the comment section. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Mysterious 7 for more compelling true crime stories.